All right, well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this policy forum. I'm E.J. McMahon, the research director and founder of the Empire Center for Public Policy. The Empire Center is a nonpartisan and nonprofit public policy research organization based here in Albany, if you're not familiar with us. Um, our mission statement, specifically, is to make New York a better place to live and work by promoting public policy reforms grounded in free market principles, personal responsibility, and the ideals of effective and accountable government. We're now in our sixth year as a freestanding independent organization. And uh, as you may know, we focused mainly on tax, fiscal, and economic policy issues, on healthcare policy, and on government accountability and transparency. We have not, in our own work, or through our own work, weighed in uh, on one side or another of the issue of legalization of marijuana in New York State. However, in keeping with our commitment to educating New Yorkers on their public policy choices, we're holding this forum today to spotlight conflicting views on the issue in general and, and different perspectives on the specific proposal that's before the legislature right now. Uh, as you know, in 1996, California became the first state through voter initiative to legalize medicinal, medicinal use of cannabis. 32 states have since followed suit, including New York in 2014. Uh, in 2012, Colorado and the state of Washington became the first states to legalize recreational use of marijuana by adults. Eight states have since uh, enacted their own legalization laws, including Michigan by voter initiative last year. And so the question uh, before us today is uh, the likelihood, it seems, or possibility that New York would join that list under legislation proposed with Governor Cuomo's pending executive budget for 2020. Now, our forum today is in two parts. Uh, and between those two segments, if you have the agenda, you can see them drawn out there, we'll take a brief five-minute break to, to real, realign our stage and rearrange the podium. After each part, the part I'm about to begin, and the second part, we will encourage questions from the audience. We'll invite them and encourage them. So keep that in mind. In the second part of the program, my colleague Bill Hammond, our health policy director, will moderate a panel of experts who will dig into the practical pros and cons of Governor Cuomo's Cannabis Regulation and Taxation Act, a proposal that uh, was introduced uh, with or as part of the executive budget. The first part of our program, however, which we're getting to now, will focus on the far more fundamental question. Should New York join the growing list of states legalizing recreational use of marijuana? If so, why? If not, why not? And to answer that fundamental question, I'm very honored to moderate a mini debate, in effect, between two knowledgeable experts with strong views, I think, safe to say, mostly on opposite sides of that issue. Uh, I'll introduce them each now, and then uh, the format will be that each of, the, of these uh, speakers will have a 10-minute introductory statement. Uh, they will get to have, make five-minute rejoinders to each other. I will spend a few minutes asking follow-up questions and then open it for questions from the audience. So I think all in all, the hour will go pretty quickly. And so I'll introduce them each now uh, uh, at first at once, and then we'll start with the first of the speakers. Uh, Mitch Earlywine, seated to my left, to your right, graduated with honors from Columbia University in the city of New York and has received a PhD in clinical psychology from Indiana University, where he served as live-in staff at the Blair House for the chronically mentally ill. He has over 200 peer-reviewed publications in scholarly journals, including the often cited Understanding, Mar uh, Understanding Marijuana, <coughs> published by Oxford University Press. <coughs> Excuse me. He taught at the University of Southern California for 14 years, where he received a grant from the federal government to study alcohol-induced aggression. He is currently professor of psychology at the University at Albany, part of the State University of New York. Seated to my right and on your left, Alex Berenson. Alex graduated from Yale University with degrees in history and economics. He ultimately joined the staff of the New York Times, where he covered everything from the drug industry to Hurricane Katrina. He also served two stints as a correspondent in Iraq, an experience that led him to write The Faithful Spy, his award-winning debut novel. 
He still contributes occasionally to the Times, but left the paper in 2010 to devote himself to writing fiction, including the John Wells spy novels. His newest book, however, is not a work of fiction. It is entitled, Tell Your Children the Truth About Marijuana, Mental Illness, and Violence, whose title is more or less self-explanatory. So <clears throat> without any further ado, we'll begin with uh, Dr. Early Wand. And you can, you're, you can feel free to sit if you'd like. I'm, I, I, okay. I couldn't. OK. <laughs> you're going to time me? Is that the? Yes, there's your timer right there. Yes. Super. My hearty thanks to the Empire Center. I really appreciate the chance to do this. Thanks so much for being here. Pity Alex Berenson. I don't think he knew what he was getting himself into. <laughs> I apologize for the reform movement who basically have called him a cherry picker and a race baiter and stigmatizing mental illness. He just needs our love and a little training and research methods. I'm going to point out his argument tends to go something like this. Cannabis leads to more psychosis, which leads to paranoia, which leads to violence. He's not saying you're going to smoke pot and become a schizophrenic zombie and punch your grandma on the face. He's just saying general trends on these are going to increase. I want to walk you through each of these and explain not only are the effects really small, but they're really straightforward in how we could intervene. So cannabis leading to increases in psychosis, the best data on that, as his book asserts, longitudinal studies are huge samples because psychosis is so rare. What we got is a problem with confounds. I can't randomly assign people to smoke pot. You get cannabis, you don't. You get cannabis, you don't. So we don't know if there was something pre-psychotic, if you will, attracting people to cannabis in the first place. And then one of the biggest confounds and one of the best theories of schizophrenia involves the dopamine system. So we need to make sure we're also controlling for drugs that work in the dopamine system. What does that mean? Of course, cocaine and amphetamine, but also Adderall, Ritalin, Modafinil, some of the things that you can get from a doctor very easily and the way that these have been measured in these longitudinal studies is not good. Data from my lab suggest if you link cannabis to schizotypal personality disorder, one of the psychotic disorders, that effect really does disappear if you control for cannabis use. Data from my lab also suggest, unfortunately, the way we measure, measure psychosis is biased against cannabis users. So one of the items on the schizotypal personality questionnaire, I use words in unusual ways. Yes, psychotics use words in unusual ways, but anybody who's kicked pack at 420 with his homies with some sour diesel also thinks he uses words in unusual ways, unfortunately endorses this item and gets labeled gets a tipple. When you pull that item out, at least in the data I published, that effect disappears. But let's assume it's really there. Let's assume it does increase psychosis. We need to spread the word. What a surprise, a university professor thinks education is the answer. But if you've got a psychotic identical twin, don't let any cannabis in. How hard is that to get out to the people? Now, we're also getting some incredible evidence to suggest that cannabidiol, the less psychoactive, probably non-psychoactive component of cannabis, may help psychosis. And so there really is a chance to make good use of this plant under those circumstances. The next step, basically psychosis to paranoia. We do have laboratory data suggesting THC will increase paranoia. Let's talk about how those studies are done and if they have any external validity, if they have any utility out in the real world. Let's see, I'm all by myself. I have a cannula in my arm and THC is slowly growing into my bloodstream. Everyone else is in a white coat and probably a psychiatrist or a nurse. I'm high all alone under fluorescent lights. Does THC make you paranoid? Of course, in that setting. How could it not? Right? But the bottom line is it doesn't have to. And here's a situation where not only could education be a big plus, let's let everybody know that you don't want to use cannabis by yourself under fluorescent lights with a bunch of psychiatrists but also that literally a milligram of cannabidiol could probably take that edge off. The magical ideation, kind of oddball components that THC tends to facilitate often will disappear in the presence of a little bit 
of CBD, which is part of the plant anyway, but has been kind of bred out because of prohibition over the years. Right? So if you're getting frightened because of THC, by all means, just add a little CBD. Okay? It's really not that hard to spread the word about that part either. All right. The last part, cannabis is going to increase aggression. Cannabis is going to make people more violent. When you survey cannabis users about this and say, hey, does marijuana make you more aggressive? They immediately say no right after they stop laughing. It's just not an effect that we see very commonly. In the lab, where people are literally randomly assigned to get THC or get placebo, and then play a game where they're literally supposed to be playing against another participant, but that person is really in cahoots with the experimenter and does these really provoking, irritating things, who gets more mad? The placebo group. Right? Almost invariably, at high doses, THC will actually decrease aggression in paradigms like that. Does that apply to anything out in the real world? I honestly didn't think so. Brad Bushman did a big analysis showing that it probably does. Right? Once in a while, we'll hear some stories about, well, it's marijuana withdrawal, if you believe in such a thing that leads to increases in aggression. The size of that effect also seems to be, shall we say, small. Right? Generally, you know, if psychosis is going to increase three times, this is we're talking like 1.6, something like that. And it's only in really specific forms of aggression, and only in men, and only in men who've been aggressive in the past. So I'm apprehensive about those kinds of things replicating data from my own student, Ashley Borders, who's now at the College of New Jersey, suggests that there's a way to intervene with this as well. Almost all these provoked, aggressive things tend to stem from rumination. Somebody does something, it makes you mad, and you chew it over in your mind over and over and over again. And then, of course, you're more likely to be hostile. Can we intervene on this too? If you're having a lot of hostile thoughts, can't you distract yourself? Couldn't I go watch The Simpsons? Couldn't I order a plate of onion rings? Obviously, there's a chance to make it so that I don't perseverate on these angry thoughts if I'm sort of aware that that's a high-risk possibility. Lo and behold, now we can at least try to keep the impact of that down, and away we go. Nevertheless, we still are kind of stuck with the idea is it worth adding yet another psychoactive substance to the legal market? Well, right now the underground isn't doing a very good job of keeping cannabis out of the hands of children, right? Nobody goes to a dealer and he says, let me see your ID, are you 21? Right? If we had a dispensary that would lose its license if they sold to underage folks, I'm guessing they'd be a little more motivated. Any other concerns? that we have about cannabis under these circumstances? Well, as some of you have already mentioned to me before I even came up here, there are genuine effects as far as medicinal use is concerned. So plenty of folks are saying, hey, CBD oil is helping my back. THC helps me sleep like never before. My PTSD symptoms are down thanks to this plant. By all means, if there's any way to just humanely make sure that folks have that opportunity, I would love to see that happen. Is marijuana a panacea? No. Is it the cure for schizotypal trichotillomania? No. But there are a handful of disorders that genuinely seem to benefit. They're not the only treatment, but they seem to be, it uh, seem to be a good treatment. So by all means, let's make sure New Yorkers have access just because it's good. It's charitable. It's the nice thing to do. I'd love to answer any questions that everybody has. Thanks so much. And we'll hold the questions until after the exchanges. Thank you. Alex? <coughs> Thank you for that. Um, All means. I uh, actually agreed with more of that than I thought I was going to agree with. Um, Mitch did not say that he doesn't think that cannabis can cause psychosis. Um, and he, did, he didn't say that uh, psychosis carries a huge downstream risk for violence. He knows those things are true. Um, so I think, uh, I think the sort of thoughts you're talking about, um, as you probably know, don't really uh, 
represent the experience that leads to violence, right? This is not, this is not uh, somebody ruminating. This is somebody having a voice shout at him or her for hours or days or weeks. Um, having a full-blown psychotic break is a terrifying and awful experience for people. Schizophrenia is a terrible disease. And to the extent, psycho to the extent cannabis can produce these experiences in people, we need to let them know. Um, uh, it's quite clear that uh, a lot of people who, who are committing terrible crimes are using cannabis at the time of the crimes, especially when there's psychosis involved. Um, there's data from Britain that shows that. There's data from Australia that shows that. Uh, there's tons of anecdotal data that shows that. Um, it's very clear from the longitudinal studies, um, the first of which came out 30 years ago, more than 30 years ago, and covered 50,000 people in Sweden, that if you use a lot of cannabis as a teenager, uh, your risk for developing schizophrenia is somewhere between two and four, increased two and fourfold. Uh, the best numbers on schizophrenia are that about one person in 150 uh, will develop it in his or her lifetime. So if you double that, you're getting an extra one person in 150. Quadrupling it would be an extra one person in 50, approximately. So you know that's that would be two percent of the population getting schizophrenia that wouldn't otherwise get it if everyone used cannabis, which of course is not going to be the case. Um, to me, that's a big number because schizophrenia is a terrible disease. Uh, it may not it may not be a big enough number to to change your views about legalization. Uh, that's a different question. The book really is not about my book is not really about politics, and it's not really even about legalization. There, I do say at the end that I don't think we should legalize this drug because I don't think we should have a commercial community promoting the use of it, and I think the experience of the last hundred years in tobacco has taught us that uh, we cannot trust the uh, promoters of addictive products to be honest with us about their dangers. Um, but, uh, but, it, but that is a different question. Um, beyond the risk of permanent psychosis, uh, cannabis causes a tremendous amount of temporary psychosis. The, you know, these are the cases where sometimes people wind up in the ER, sometimes they don't. Uh, you, know, they, you have a gummy and you're on the floor for 12 hours thinking that somebody's gonna break into your house and kill you. That's psychosis. Um, if you go to the ER, they may tell you you're having a panic attack. They may tell you you're paranoid, but on your diagnosis, it's gonna say you have cannabis-induced psychosis. Um, the data for my book, uh, which unfortunately goes to 2014 because uh, there was, at the time I was writing, there was not more recent data available, showed that uh, about more than 10% of all the ER admissions for psychosis in the United States in 2014 were for heavy cannabis users. Uh, who are about one and a half percent of the population. I'm talking about people with a diagnosable cannabis use disorder. Um, that, that was 90,000 people in 2014, so that's a couple hundred people a day, every day, showing up at ERs with psychosis. Um, uh, not all those people are gonna get violent, not all those people are gonna do anything terrible, some of them will. Uh, psycho again, psychosis is a massive risk for violence. Schizophrenia, people with schizophrenia, uh, are about 20 times more likely to commit homicides than people who are healthy. And most of that risk is mediated by drug use. In other words, if you're not taking drugs, recreational drugs, and you're taking your antipsychotics, you're not at a huge excess risk for violence, but if you are, your risk is really off the charts. Um, if you just do the math, if most of the people who are, who are not taking drugs and who are on antipsychotics are not at excess risk, and the total risk is 20x, the, people, the risk of the people who are using drugs has to be much higher than that. Um, so, so, again, I'm not here to tell you that there's only, that we're gonna, that we need to make this drug illegal. We, you know, we're not gonna put 40 million people in jail for cannabis use. And the fact is that in New York and in most states, cannabis possession effectively has been decriminalized anyway. So, uh, you know, so, I think really the question is how far up the chain you wanna extend decriminalization. I was talking to the New York Special Narcotics Prosecutor last week and she said to me, effectively they don't prosecute cannabis at all. Um, you know, if you, if you happen to be dealing meth and you have cannabis on the side, you know, maybe you'll get caught up in an investigation, but they're not chasing cannabis users at, or, or dealers or traffickers at all. Um, so, you know, if that's where we wind up, that's where we wind up. Uh, and to me, 
the issue is really, and, and I think Mitch said this, it's really about warning people. It's about telling people that this is, this is not a harmless drug. Um, and for a lot of people, it's actually a dangerous drug. Uh, we're not afraid to say that about tobacco. We're not afraid to say that about alcohol. You know, not everybody who drinks and drives is gonna get into an accident, but we say drinking and driving is dangerous and you shouldn't do it. Uh, not everybody who smokes tobacco gets lung cancer, but we say tobacco causes lung cancer. Um, given the magnitude of this risk and given the severity of the consequences, both for the person who's suffering, for his family, and, uh, and for society, because psychosis is incredibly expensive to treat and, uh, and really impossible to treat effectively. I mean, I mean, some people do get better, but you know, we don't really know why. We don't really know why the drugs work on some people and don't work on other people. Um, given those issues, uh, it seems to me that to, to rush to legalize this, uh, this drug in a way that's inevitably gonna encourage its use and, and to encourage its use by the people who are most vulnerable um, by in telling them that this might be good for their psychiatric conditions, you know, it's good if you have insomnia, it's good if you have anxiety. I think that I think that's a just a bizarre decision that we're making. Um, at best, this is a recreational intoxicant. It should be presented that way to people. Um, it has side effects uh, for some people. Unfortunately, those side effects are really severe, and and that's where we should be if we're going to legalize it, or if we're not going to legalize it, because plenty of people are going to use it, whatever its legal status. This is what we need to tell people. Um, so I, uh, I thank you all for coming, and I will gladly take whatever questions you have. And now we'll have the, we each get five minutes for sort of rejoinders. You can, uh, Mitch, you can come back at things that Alex has just said. Well, isn't this friendly? <laughs> <laughs> I do want to just point out that it's easy to exaggerate some of the estimates of the level of increase in psychosis simply because the studies that we've been talking about don't do a good job of controlling for those covariates. So they're very careful about the measure of cannabis use and how often and at what age and things like that. And then they say, oh, have you ever snorted Coke? Yes, no. So we may be missing, it may be that cannabis is a proxy for some of these more dopaminergic drugs. Truth be told, psychosis probably develops because of some heritable component and then some environmental insult. My friend, Dr. Sarnoff Mednick at USC has shown this time and again, if we really want to lower rates of psychosis, by all means, let's fund good prenatal care because that is often where the first environmental insult is. You're getting pulled out with the <laughs> obstetric stuff and then suddenly things aren't going as well. Any woman who's got a psychotic disorder and who is pregnant really needs to be in touch with medical care, and I think that's gonna do way more than anything we can do uh, with the psychotic drugs. This notion of temporary psychosis is kind of sad because it really all revolves around the use of edibles. So when, Cal when California had edibles and when Colorado had edibles, I think it was Maureen Dowd went out to Colorado and basically overdosed herself and had a horrible time. And then my friend Jacob Solomon Reason made the same mistake and he knows better. You know. How do we get the word out on this? Fortunately, some of my students are out there already doing this research. We're trying to train folks to not have aversive experience to edibles, and it's literally start low and go slow. Again, if you've got psycho psychotics in the family, this is not the plant for you. And now the notion about treating anxiety, for example, with THC, come see my grad students in 12 sessions, we'll have you done, right? It's, it's not the kind of thing that you absolutely have to have for, for that reason. There are tons and tons of other herbal remedies for that. Kava, kava works really well. I've got the data. Here, you know, here, here's a way to get around this if that's what you want. Nevertheless, for the nausea, the vomiting, some of the cancer-related chemotherapy, weight loss related to AIDS and things like that, it really is good. But those literatures are moving really, really quickly. Maybe a new drug will come out right away. And we're, again, talking about caution and education, not throwing people in jail not giving everybody a ticket. I do want to emphasize that law enforcement in this state has not been great as far as how ethnicity relates to busts. Right? Yeah, it's decriminalized, but it's still a hassle. I'm not saying old white Jews with beards are immune either. Like Anybody can go in and end up getting busted and have to go in front of a jug judge and lose a day and pay an attorney and things like that, that's hard on folks. 
And I don't really feel like that's necessarily the answer. And then my last hope is that I know it's looming, so let's get into the driving issue. Yes, alcohol and driving is really dreadful. And truth be told, cannabis-induced driving, depending upon whose data you look at, is not perfect, certainly not terrible. The problem has been how do we assess people's use. Unfortunately, a urine screen is telling you about THC you may have consumed two weeks earlier. Even the blood tests aren't perfect. But by all means, roadside sobriety tests. Let's take a look at how people do on that. And even Benadryl, which at 50 milligrams impairs driving, could be detected that way. If you're too tired to drive, it would detect it that way. If you really just aren't competent to drive, it would detect it that way. And moving in that direction instead of, oh my God, is there a metabolite in your God knows what, would be a much more humane, much nicer way to go about this policy. Thank you, and Alex, one more rejoinder uh, to that. Sure, I, I, would, I would agree actually that the driving thing is a, is a, is a real problem, and uh, you know, some states have said, we're just gonna say five nanograms per milliliter. Uh, I think there are clearly people out there who can build a tolerance to cannabis, and so it's, it's hard to know what the standard should be. Um, uh, you know, I, I wish that uh, the DPA and other people had been more like you in talking <laughs> about this, honestly, um, instead of telling me that I don't understand the science or that correlation is not causation. Um, the, the book is about how people have been working on this for 30 years. And there's a lot of, you're, you're right that we still aren't, you know, we're not, I would say we're not where we are in tobacco and lung cancer with this. Um, there's much more work to be done, but people have spent a long time teasing out uh, people who might have had prodrom prodromal psychosis and other psychosis that has not reached a clinical level yet. Um, there's, there's, there, you know, there's a really good study from New Zealand that tracks, that's tracked people for 40 years and it has data dating back to age 11 to see who had symptoms of psychosis. And even when you look at those people and you sort of split them out, um, uh, cannabis was more likely to cause psychosis in other people. Um, uh, you know, I, I guess one question I'd ask you is, do you ethically expose people who say they have a history of psychosis to THC in your lab? Um, oh God, but I can't expose anyone to THC in my lab oh. thanks to the DEA. Um, and, and this is, by the way, this is something I say in the book. I think that we should, you know, I think that people like you should be able to do research. Um, I think we should find out, you know, if From there are- From your mouth to the government's ear. Um, so, so, you know, I, I wish, my, my issue with the advocacy community is I feel like, I guess because, you, you know, people have been trying to legalize this drug and change minds uh, for a long time, they haven't been honest about the risks. And they've promoted, uh, you know, cannabis for opioid addiction. Uh, JAMA just last week had an, had a, had an uh, editorial saying, you know, there's really no good evidence to put people who are uh, using opioids on cannabis. And if you, look at the, if you look at the longitudinal studies, they show that people who use cannabis are much more likely to use opioids later. Um, the state, you know, the sort of the state level epidemiologic data is not very convincing. The individual level data is convincing. Now there's a lot of potential reasons for that. Um, you know, it is possible that if you have to buy cannabis illegally and your friendly neighborhood dealer is also selling heroin and cocaine, you're more likely to wind up buying heroin and cocaine from that person. I mean, that's what the Dutch thought and that's why they made, uh, you know, that's why they allowed coffee shops 40 years ago. Um, it's also possible that using an addictive drug that gets you high primes you to use other addictive drugs that get you high. Um, and, and I think the, and it's also possible that you're just somebody, out, you know, you're a person who likes to take risks. So you, take, you use cannabis and then five years later, you know, you drive 100 miles an hour and you're, you're just a risk taker. I think, I think probably it's some combination of those things. But I think the idea that cannabis is a solution for the opioid epidemic is something that nobody seriously considered until about five years ago. And somehow the advocacy community has seized on this. So I, I, I think, I think we, we need to be honest about what we're gonna tell people about this. But before we can be honest about what we're gonna tell people about this, we need to be honest about what the risks really are. Well, thank you. Um, and um, I think I'm not going to ask a few questions. Think up your own questions, please. Don't, don't be shy. After I ask a few follow-up questions, I hope to have your questions as well, which should be questions and not statements or argumentation. Um, I'm sure you can come up with something. There's a lot of people in the room who've thought a lot about this, I'm sure, and have 
curiosity about other issues. I'd like to ask a few follow-ups of each of you. Um, Mitch, I, I, I'd like to start by asking you, there was a point that uh, Alex and other uh, critics of the legalization regime as it's uh, panning out in different states have made, which is that when you, do, when you pass a statute legalizing recreational use, um, you basically then create an industry that has an interest in promoting and marketing marijuana use and thus creates interest that goes far beyond the, the, those who sh can or should, can use it legally or should use it at all. Um, certainly that's the case. I just, I don't watch much TV, but I watch sports around the Super Bowl and college basketball and, you know, there's all the, there's commercials for beer, there's online, all the little commercials that now pop up in your stream. There's a lot of booze commercials. Um, the, the disclaimers about alcoholism, and if you've had any personal experience with alcoholism, you know how horrific that is, somehow don't seem to cut through. So you do have a commercial, you're gonna create an industry that has a tremendous influence in talking about how great it is to, to use cannabis, smoke marijuana, without getting into the downsides, even if there's a legally prescribed warning. How do you counter that, in other words, Teenagers, now, people who shouldn't smoke now can get it illegally. Won't there be more interest and curiosity in it among teenagers if it's legal for adults? It's a curious question and a complicated one. I hate when academics who are experts in one field pretend like they're experts in all fields. And so I need to say that my policy training is limited. I can cite Mark Kleiman, who is quite the policy wonk, who has made several suggestions along these lines. We didn't see the outrageous sky is falling teen use spikes in Colorado, Washington, California, places like that, that everyone had feared, in part because teens were into their own thing, nobody wants grandmas, nausea meds, et cetera. But as that starts to normalize, perhaps use will increase. Uh, unfortunately, I think part of that has been that prescription stimulants are on the rise, that they've just got a drug of their own now, and so we, we may still have a problem, it's just not a cannabis problem. What Mark has suggested essentially is, uh, he thinks alcohol is under-regulated though, what if everybody had their marijuana license and you could get two ounces of cannabis per month go to a dispensary, show your license, and then once you're over that amount, you're done for the month. You can imagine all the complications that are inherent in that, but here's an opportunity to sort of keep quantity to a minimum, and truth be told, if you know you're running into problems, hand in your license and say, I need to, I need to take a break, I need to. You mean like a World War II ra food ration card? I'm afraid so. Okay. And Unfortunately, that's not an association <laughs> I'd, I'd like to make, but, but it's that sort of same function. Only those of us who are old enough to have grown up the generation after that will know <laughs> what I'm talking about. Mm. Um, uh, Alex, uh, the, the, uh, do you have any, re come back to what um, Mitch uh, just said about uh, that? Um, I, I, I think, unfortunately, legalization does drive up use rates. It's clear from the legalized states. Um, uh, it, the, the biggest increase seems to be 18 to 25, uh, but it, but legalization uh, rates are significantly higher in the legalized states than nationally overall. And um, you know, one very interesting thing that's happened with teen use nationally is that it hasn't really changed in the last few years. A every other uh, level has risen. I mean, every other age group has seen rising levels. Teens have not. They've seen teens have generally like had healthier behaviors in general the last. 10 years or so, there's less teen drinking, there's, you know, teen, teen abortion rates are down, teen sex has been delayed a little bit. So, so there's a, you know, I think a lot of people are, are wondering why that is, and they're also wondering whether the rise of vaping in the last year or two is, is about to, you know, has totally changed that again. Um, certainly anecdotally in talking to parents when I, just being in the last month on tour for this book and, and hearing from parents, it seems to me that there's a, there's a real not so quiet crisis in vaping. Um, and once you start vaping nicotine, it's very easy to vape THC. So I do wonder in the next uh, year or two if we're gonna see a big increase in teen THC use, which would be really bad because teen brains are obviously the most at risk from, uh, from THC's effects. Um, so a long story short, I don't think that, I think there's a lot of evidence that legalization does increase use in, in the states that legalize. It's, it, 
for now has been a little bit less age 12 to 17, but uh, I don't think we can count on that continuing. Well, now let me follow up by asking you the question that is one of the key questions that arises whenever we discuss fundamentally legalization in general. For you, from your perspective, the question is the why not question. And that always begins, get early on, gets into the subject of alcohol. Uh, alcohol, con alcohol in different forms has been something that people have been consuming for uh, millennia. Uh, the one national experiment without lawing, it didn't go too well. Um, but that, by the way, that experiment, and if you read the, I'm forgetting his, uh, Dan Oreskes' really great, uh, not Oreskes, uh, the guy who wrote the book on Prohibition. Um, anyway, former, the Times Ombudsman, so I thought you might remember his name. Oh, not Sam um, I mean, the, the, the Prohibitionists, the original Prohibitionists, were motivated by the horrific results of alcohol consumption, uh, especially, particularly among poor people. Uh, so alcohol has, a, there's a heavy prevalence, there's a large number of people who can't drink one drop, should not, cannot drink one drop. Uh, alcohol has had horrific effects uh, throughout time. Now, it's not clear to me, you, perhaps you correct me, that let's say the very severe effects on people, the, psycho the, the link to psychosis and the severe effects on people with, a pre with perhaps a genetic predilection to that problem are, are, I don't know whether they're as pronounced as the problems that alcohol causes or not, but I would ask you, since we already have regulated by the states to varying degrees widespread al alcohol legalization for adults, 21 is the common age, why, why wouldn't you do it after due consideration of regulatory issues for marijuana, for cannabis? So, so that's, a, that's, a, that's a very fair question. A, a couple of things. Alcohol is much more uh, a part of American society than, than cannabis. Uh, it always has been. Uh, it still is. 65% um, of Americans had a drink in 20, adults and over 12, had a drink in 2017. And if I could interrupt uh, for a minute, yeah. just knowing that, it, the, and by the next question somebody would ask is, okay, so if they substituted marijuana, or why yes. not, why, would, so, why shouldn't it be? So, that would so, be oh, so yes, so 65% so of Americans had a drink in 2017, 15% of Americans used cannabis. Um, it is, it's still a relatively marginal drug. Half the country has never used cannabis. Um, and, and the U.S., by the way, has the highest rates of any country in the, in the I, maybe not in the world, maybe Israel might be higher, but, it, but certainly in, of major Western countries. Uh, the U.S. and Canada are the outliers here. Most European countries, uh, fewer than 10% of people use cannabis in a year. Um, uh, and and uh, in Britain, actually, it's, it's more like 8 or 9%. So, so, so we have a choice with cannabis that we don't really have with alcohol. Alcohol, there's just... It's not going to be prohibited. We tried it. it the too, the, it's too much a part of the country. Uh, and cannabis, we're not going to put, again, we're not going to put everybody in jail for using it. That, that's, it's clearly too big a part of society for that. But we do have a choice as to whether we want a full industry. Now, as to whether or not, let's say that 65% that of people actually used cannabis instead of drinking. Um, honestly, it is not, what people will tell you is there are 90,000 deaths a year from alcohol use. Um, there are no deaths from cannabis. Neither of those things is really true. <laughs> so if you, if, you, if you look at the, uh, the way the 90,000 number is, is, uh, is calculated, about 30 or 40,000 of those deaths are from the physical effects of alcohol. So alcohol is obviously a physically toxic substance. You can drink too much of it, you can shut your liver down, you can get cirrhosis, you can die. You can die acutely or chronically. Um, but the other deaths are homicide, suicide, uh, tri driving accidents um, and falls mainly are the four big categories. Uh, now, nobody has, and those numbers basically come off studies in the, in the 90s and even the 80s and 70s where people looked at driving accidents and the number of, uh, you know, the, the number of people who were, who were drinking at the time of the accidents. They looked at homicides. And if, you know, if somebody had a blood alcohol content above a certain level, they said, okay, this is alcohol caused. Um, nobody has ever done that with cannabis. I actually would like uh, to try to find, you know, a PhD or a bunch of PhDs to do this work. Um, it is clear to me, just based on the tox reports that I've seen from Colorado, the homicides that, you know, the, the number of homicides that I've seen where cannabis was clearly being used by the person, um, that you would get a number in the 
low in the four to low five figures for that. I don't know what the number would be. Somebody's got to do the work. But And I'm not saying, by the way, that you can then say, oh, cannabis killed 12,000 people in the United States last year. I'm saying that if you calculate this the way you calculate the alcohol number, you're going to get a significant number. Um, that's just, that's just, a, it's just a fact that nobody's done any work on it. Okay. Um, I, one more question. We'll open it to the, I just want to have a follow-up with you. Um, uh, Mitch, um, Alex began by saying, after your opening, said, well, thank you, you didn't say that, uh, that marijuana is not linked to psychosis, which is a major theme of his book. And he cites, as you know, in his book and, and his talk just now, among other things, uh, uh, very large, statistically powerful longitudinal studies in Sweden and I think New Zealand as well that had to do with that. And so the question is, is there any kind of warning or regulatory regime um, that would make legalization on the scale we're considering worth doing given what we allegedly know about the link to psychosis, and I'll create one more context. Uh, you, this is maybe something you both agree on. We have a mental illness crisis uh, in our society in general, in New York in particular. You don't have to be trained to spot the mental illness component of, the, of our street people, vagrancy, homelessness problem. So with all that in mind, was he reading too much into what you said, and how would you deal with the issue? Of, what, what's your comeback on the issue of psychosis and the link between marijuana and psycho or cannabis and psychosis? I think what, what has happened is the, the three times and four times have gotten reified when some of these covariates are added, and when you look at some of the studies that are more average effect size rather than extremes, perhaps it's twice as much, but again, we don't know given the poor measurement of these dopaminergic drugs like modafinil, Ritalin, Adderall, and things like that. But nevertheless, if, if it is there, splitting hairs about the size of the effect isn't, isn't effective. I think public service announcements that make it super clear that this is not the thing to do if you have psychosis in the family. I tell the story a lot. My dad came home when he was 10 years old. My Aunt Laura said, you never have to go to school again. And he was all excited. And then she said, because I'm the Messiah. <laughs> and realized, oh my God, this is a psychotic break. And so, you know, clearly this is a family that shouldn't be anywhere near the, the cannabinoid drugs and stay away from the dopaminergic ones as well. In other situations, people could really use that harmlessly. I can't literally at the dispensary say, do you have psychosis in the family and decide can I distribute based on that? But I sure could have a great big uh, poster up saying, you know, do you know Mitch's great Aunt Laura? It's, it's, uh, as a follow up to that, one quick question it has to do with the edibles. And but again, I've, as I said at the beginning, I haven't independently researched this personally or organizationally. <laughs> um, uh, but it would seem to me, and it, there's some st pretty horrific stories recited in, in Alex's book in terms of some violent outbursts by people, um, not just uh, New York Times columnists. Um, the, it seemed to me to be really easy to, to like chew on a brownie, especially if you have a sweet tooth anyway. Is, is there a differentia sufficient differentiation to suggest that it should not be legalized in a form that is so analogous to eating candy or sweets? Uh, I'm just, it, term, it does form uh, matter as much as the... Uh, I mean, I'm a, I'm a big fan of uh, making sure that no edible has more than five milligrams of THC if it looks like... Well, why like would you have any edible with any THC in it? That's what oh, I, a, a number of people appreciate the fact that it's a slow onset and, and a long duration. So if you're using it for sleep and you really don't want to just get really high and then have to drop, you want to have an edible because of that uh, method of administration has certain advantages, but to have that Maureen Dowd situation where you've got a thing that looks just like a brownie that anyone would eat in one session, and it's 60 milligrams of THC, that sounds scary. A number of medical users tell me, no, that's right on, on track for me, but I, I just can't, I can't endorse that idea. I feel like, you know, certainly a 10 milligram standard dose edible, which is I think the, the rule now in, in a couple of states, that, that makes sense. Starting to do these proof war, mine is stronger than yours things in advertising and stuff is not a good idea at all. Okay. Any, so, uh, no, I, I would agree though. I, I think it's interesting with edibles. I, I have heard from any number of people, I, you know, if, if you are a pot 
naive, you're cannabis naive, and you wind up in Seattle, and your and your you know friend is like, let's <coughs> let's try an edible. You can have a really horrific trip. Um, you know, if you're if you're not used to what the sensation is, and people, and you know, the people who who break, or uh, maybe they don't have a full permanent psychotic break, but people have. Sometimes they have after effects that last for weeks or months. It's it's actually pretty surprising to me that this can happen on a few milligrams of, a, of an edible, and that we really do need to warn people about that. All right, I'm going to open it now to questions from the floor. And again, we have a microphone so that this becomes part of the video. We're, and let me add one quick thing: We're, we are we are are recording the, of making a video recording of this. If you're on the list having RSVP, we'll send you an email when it's posted, hopefully in a few days and you can spread it around if you found it interesting. So it's important that if you have a question, you go to the microphone in the back of the room and our first questioner is there, so. Hi, Julie Killian. I run a local prevention coalition in Rye, New York. Um, so Mr. Erlewine, you seem to suggest that the um, answer is just educate, regulate, and then add some CBD and everything's gonna be okay, but that's not what we're seeing on the ground. Uh, in legalized states, the black market hasn't gone away. Teen use is really high. And uh, our kids are now vaping 100% THC hash oil, um, in the in mostly in jewels. So there's been I, I just spent a week at a prevention conference in Washington with 3,000 other prevention people, and pretty much across the board, we're we're doing okay on the alcohol and the opioids, but vaping way up, marijuana way up. So and is there so is there you've a question? talked about yes. The it. question is so you've talked about <coughs> studies, but. The studies haven't been done. Our kids are smoking 100%, almost 100% THC in their vapes. So how do you respond to that when you, you seem to suggest marijuana is okay? But that sure. the marijuana you may be talking about is not right. what our kids are doing. Uh, truth be told, we've been lying to them for decades and we have to stop. If I say marijuana is gonna make you do heroin the next day, if I say you're gonna be schizophrenic when you take one puff off a joint, they don't believe it. And more importantly, then they don't believe it when I say, oh, by the way, methamphetamine is super addictive and literally will shrink your brain. If we were more candid about the fact that, yes, 100% THC is nowhere near anything anyone needs and hadn't lied to them for decades before, I think maybe they would believe us from an educational standpoint. But to say, hey, if you own this, I'm gonna throw you in jail, they know that the probability of busts is low enough that they're sensation seekers, they're gonna go ahead and try to do this anyway, and we don't get anywhere either. So I do feel like a tax and regulated market where CBD is present and where the education is honest instead of alarmist is all we can do. I, I honestly don't have any, any other alternatives. I certainly know that taking away their financial aid to go to college or tossing them in jail certainly isn't doing the trick. Um, so in, in this isn't this is the one well it's one place I have I got to push back I mean because the messaging is exactly the opposite of that I mean the, I don't see anybody out there saying marijuana causes schizophrenia or marijuana is a gateway drug to heroin you know NIDA and the prevention people are up to their rears in uh, or up to their eyeballs in uh, uh, you know trying to deal with an opioid crisis that's killing tens of thousands of people a year nobody's talking about marijuana at all except the people who are in favor of it and. You know, it, my joke about this is that when uh, when I want to get psychotic, I don't I don't smoke cannabis. I watch high maintenance, where you know it's which is an HBO show where your friendly local dealer bike bikes around Manhattan or bikes around Williamsburg delivering cannabis to 19 year old girls and pregnant women. I mean, and and he's portrayed basically as a saint. I mean, this is the messaging is insane right now around cannabis, and it is really a failure of journalism and a failure of Hollywood. Okay, we have a line of questioners forming, so <clears throat> I'll invite the next question. Thank you very much. And tell me if you could state your name and say who, which, who you'd like to, if, if either one of the speakers, who you'd like to direct your question to. Um, okay, well, my name is Ornella Quinn, and I actually live in Massachusetts. And I, I guess I would direct this to Dr. Um, Earlywine. Um, so, you know, according, of course, now I lost it, according to um, a national study, we see that um, in across the nation, if you look at 12-year-olds or the age group of 18-year-olds and over, you actually see twice the national average of usage in those age groups. 
And my main concern, I have teenage boys, and ever since legalization in Massachusetts, the perceived risk in our teenagers has decreased while the use has increased. And it's the commercialized products that has, um, you know, we, we talk about THC, but we all know we're talking about these studies we see are based on THC around 13 to 15%. What we have right now, and um, what our last speaker just said, is that our teenagers, and I know this firsthand, are vaping up to three times a day in the school classroom oh. during school hours, 85% um, THC. Now, can I um, just Yeah, to so my question I to you is, um, you gave some, um, some good suggestions as far as, well, if you know you have a history of psychosis or mental illness in the family, you should avoid. And of course, adding more CBD to the, um, to the solution would also help reduce these psychotic effects, which are wonderful suggestions. But my question to you is how um, should a 12-year-old or 16-year-old go about doing that? Now, um, how do they know the, the, the family history? And even if they're told, why do we still see these, these, the usage rate skyrocket? Okay. I think that's the question then. Yeah. I, the bottom line is I, I honestly can't support use below age 21 unless it's medicinal. And how is it then leaking out to them? Again, we, we're gonna have to do better. The notion of anybody getting high before trying to learn something, what a waste of time. Mm -hmm. The hippocampus is essentially just not at work at the time. You're not gonna learn anything new in school. Some of those IQ data that everybody often makes a big deal out of aren't because people have become dumb, it's because they went to school and didn't learn anything uh, on those days. You, you can't absorb new information while you're high. It's super, super difficult. Wonderful. So to have better prevention efforts as far as that's concerned, I think is certainly money well spent. I would never talk about earmarking money from one thing for another thing at a place like this, but you could certainly imagine devoting cash to the idea that we're gonna have accurate prevention efforts on it. But anybody who's selling a 12-year-old a, mm -hmm. a jewel that's 85% THC mm -hmm. needs a beat. Right. And, and this is an uh, we have we have other questioners though so I think I if you don't mind is a line forming so I okay. and we have can I ask one follow-up question so you make it though? very quick very Thanks. very quick would you recommend then doctor that perhaps we're rushing to legalization before we have certain things in place where we can better regulate and better enforce okay full stop yes a again I'm not a policy expert but the, the bottom line is if we're not going to devote money to prevention, we shouldn't, we shouldn't legalize. Okay, next question. Hi, my name's Jeanette and I'm from Oneida County. Um, you made the statement, I'm sorry, this is for Mitch, that people with a history of psychosis in the family, you know, should stay away from this. Well, for my county, and I'm assuming counties across the state, with the closures of the mental health hospitals, we have a lot of people out in the community who have severe mental health. And some of our most vulnerable people with mental health are very hard to work with, they don't wanna to go to their clinics, they don't wanna take their meds. How are we gonna control them using or not using? Okay, that's our question. I, I actually emphasized to EJ that I wanted to make sure in my introduction you knew I lived at the Blair House for the chronic mentally ill. I lived with 10 psychotics all through grad school in order to pay the bills and I have nothing but respect for anybody who is in the trenches in that world. And truth be told, there's a relatively new therapy called motivational interviewing. It's super intensive. It requires one-on-one -on -one time. It is not the kind of thing that you just read a piece <coughs> of paper and then everybody gets better. If you're willing to get 12 sessions of that paid for, I'm optimistic that people will get better. But the state or someone has to shell out the cash. You can't just have a, a magical TV commercial and every and everybody gets better. So thank you for doing it. That's really all I can say. Alex, you have some something to No, I mean I I, I I mean I second what you're saying about the first of all, anybody who is dealing with this population on a daily basis, you're you're doing incredible work. Um, uh, I mean this is we do not have the money for if even a one a doubling in the increase, I mean it's not gonna be a doubling because again, not everyone's gonna smoke, but but the system, a major increase in psychosis uh, slash schizophrenia would overwhelm the mental health system, not just in New York, but everywhere. And uh, 
you know, my wife, so she was, the reason I wrote this book clearly is that, it, I mentioned in the book, my wife is, was the director of forensics at the Mid-Hudson Forensic Psychiatric Institute, which is where one of the facilities where the state sends the criminally mentally ill. Um, so that, that facility has about 300 patients. It looks like a prison. You know, you can't, you can't put people in, in, in restraints under, except under extraordinary circumstances. So it has to have very, very high staffing levels. Um, for those 300 patients, the state spends about $100 million a year. Um, it, this is an expensive, expensive population to treat. I, I, and I beg your pardon, that's chicken feed. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, that's $300,000 a patient I, you know, per year. And so if, if, if this really spirals in the way that it could, uh, you know, the, whatever, ta and we, you know, the tax revenue thing is the next panel, whatever, but whatever money the state gets from this is going to be poured down the, the drain faster than you can imagine. Okay, next question. Hi, my name is Kimberly Krepp. I'm the director of the Capital District Cannabis Consortium. I'm also a writer for The Shadow. Um, I have a couple questions. Uh, Professor Earlywine, you mentioned that you would like to see licensing with a two ounce cap. Yeah, what if I have three ounces? What if I have 16 and I want to make some oil for my mother who's dying of cancer? I'm happy to entertain <laughs> going back and forth on that, but. We already have some penalties for possession that I think are- Actually, are two ounces is decrimmed in Albany. Exactly. The problem is, the problem is, when you come in and you try to regulate the people for what the people can do under the misguided use, saying, oh, well, we need to deal with schizophrenia, there's three types of schizophrenia. New York State Affordable Care Act has failed, all right? If you're on Medicaid and you're homeless, you can only get your a certain prescription. You may not be able to get what you need, and you may not get the, a full year's prescription because their services are capped. Okay, so a question for Alex then so based the, on that. So the, so the big question is, why are we looking to cr continue criminalizing marijuana instead of overhauling the mental health system that needs it? Would one be that, would it, given the alternative, would it be more effective to do the latter than the former, I think is the question. I, I mean, I don't know how we overhaul the mental health system. I do know that introducing more psychosis onto our streets and into our prisons and into our schools is a terrible idea. Okay, got a long line. I'm sorry, but thank you very much for your question. Yes, next question. Hi, my name is Whitney and I'm a youth advocate. Um, my question is for Professor Early Wine, although I invite you, Mr. Branstein, to answer if you know the answer. Um, you had mentioned that Basically, drug dealers now are not doing a good job of, you know, yeah. IDing their They clients. sell underage. Yes. Um, and my question for you is, is there, is there like specific data that gives you reason to believe that uh, people who are growing and selling marijuana illegally will stop um, once it's legalized? That um, has not been the experience in California and Washington State, in part because the the enforcement is so strange, the price has dropped so quickly, and things like that, but the chance to at least have a legal dispensary where folks under 21 don't have access is a step in that right direction, but the underground market has not disappeared in any state. Okay, so can you, oh, sorry. Um, um, so I, I think you're right, I think that's a huge, it's a huge problem. Um, it's a problem on a couple of levels. First of all, if you're gonna have a regulatory scheme where people under 21 can't buy, there's gonna be a black market to serve those people. Um, if you're gonna allow home grows, which most of the states do, the easiest place to allow, you know, to, to hide a 50 plant home grow is in a 12 plant home grow. And so, you, so it's very, very difficult to outlaw the black market, it turns out, period. It's, I mean, I don't think that this is something that the advocacy community necessarily foresaw. I think this is just an unfortunate fact of the fact, or a fact of the result that it's pretty easy to grow your own cannabis, much easier than making your own alcohol, right? And so, um, you know, when you, when you have legalized alcohol, you effectively eliminate the black market in alcohol. That just is not true of cannabis. And that's one reason why the states that have legalized still have this big problem with violence around the black market. So I, I don't know the answer to this, which is why it's why I'm saying so much what we don't want is a situation where you have a legalized community promoting use because you don't eliminate the black market. You just have, you have a, you've got legalizers or, you know, in a for-profit community promoting use. Plus you have super cheap black market homegrown. Okay, we have time for one more question. I'm sorry, but, and um, 
I'm sorry that's the case, but we have time for one more question and a round of answers to those questions. Thank you very much, and go ahead. Hi, thank you so much for your remarks today. My name is Judy Mezzi. I work for a substance abuse prevention agency, and uh, we are struggling to keep our heads above water with funding issues. And uh, Dr. Earlywine, you are keep talking about education being the answer. Um, for every penny I can spend on prevention, the alcohol industry has millions to spend on prevention, the tobacco industry, the jewel company, and legalization means commercialization, and it means commercialization especially in already struggling, vulnerable populations and communities. We see that predatory marketing okay, happening. Is there a so question? So my question for you is, how in the world are the prevention advocates supposed to begin to compete with legalized markets? Okay, it just question. can't be. And all I can say is we, we have to make the folks who are benefiting from legalization pay for that. Okay. Um, I, I, I'll just say I, I was expecting that I was going to be the one under fire much more than you were, Mitch. And I think, I mean, I think what this is a demonstration of is the reality of what's going on on the streets is not the reality of, of high maintenance and, uh, you know, what the advocates say is happening. There, there are a lot of people who are having real problems with this drug already, especially in the high THC, the concentrate form. And, uh, and I think that's only going to get worse as use goes up. Well, as I expected, I expected to be frustrated with the duration of this and that it would go quickly and that we'd be just scratch the surface of both sides, which we've done, but which is better than not even approaching the subject. And so I'm very, again, I'm very grateful to Professor Earlywine and to Mr. Berenson for being here with us. People who have questions, if you'll be around a little bit, during the break, we're going to take a five minute or so break <clears throat> just to set up the stage, remind you of two things. Again. There'll be a video of this posted online within a few days. You'll find out about that if you're on the email. If not, keep an eye on our site, empirecenter.org. It would be under events. <clears throat> uh, copies of Alex Berenson's book are also available in the back of the room uh, from the book house. Uh, we have some other materials. I think we have a Reason Foundation report that's very interesting that, we, that was called to our attention. Or we, we, don't, oh, we didn't copy that. Okay, we don't have it. But anyway, they have a report about how to deal with the traffic stop and the issue and the DWI issue. Well, good morning again. My name is Bill Hammond. I'm the uh, Health Policy Director at the Empire Center. Um, I'm going to dispense with the lengthy introductions. Uh, the, the biographies are in the program. Um, but I will, we're, we're going to start with opening remarks by each of our four panelists. There, uh, the purpose of this segment is, uh, in the joking phrase, to get into the weeds. Um, each panelist is going to bring kind of a unique uh, angle on the proposed legislation, uh, and then we'll have a chance to discuss among the panelists and take questions from the audience. Um, our first uh, panelist is Heather Trella, who oversees day-to-day -day operations of the Rockefeller Institute and serves as the president's primary liaison with management. She's a doctoral candidate and holds a master's degree in political science from the Rockefeller College of Public Affairs. Good morning. Um, I come at this issue from a federalism viewpoint. Uh, federalism is the relationship between the federal government and state governments. And I like to joke with my students that this is the gateway drug to get them interested in federalism is marijuana policy. Um, so my purpose is kind of set the context within New York State, how they're implementing, because they're not doing this in a vacuum. Um, for most other things that states legalize, they don't need to worry as much about the federal government. That's not the case, obviously, with marijuana. Um, those states have legalized marijuana use for recreational medical pur pur purposes it is still federally illegal. And that is an issue that states need to navigate and take into consideration. Now there's a few things that have made that easier for states in the past, which are not so much in play now. Um, the first is that under the Obama, well, let me go back to the beginning. Uh, marijuana was criminalized as a schedule one drug by the Controlled Substances Act in the 1970s. Um, put in that designation because it was seen to have no medical use and highly addictive. Um, that obviously impacts what marijuana can be used for. 
Um, however, as states started to expand, um, there was some movement in the federal government to make it easier for states to implement marijuana policy. Um, the first of those things was uh, a series of memos issued by the Department of Justice, uh, the most recent being the Cole memo, that basically said the federal government, D Department of Justice, was going to kind of operate laissez-faire on state medical, state marijuana policy. If a state had a rigorous program in place, this was not going to be a high priority for enforcement by the federal government. Um, that was in place in 2014 and was recently overturned when Attorney General, former Attorney General Sessions rescinded that guidance. Um, what that did is that caused a lot of confusion, and that's kind of the word of the day for why federalism matters in marijuana policy, is because this is a federally illegal product, it causes a lot of confusion in state implementation of what can and cannot be done. Um, the other provision that kind of protects uh, medical marijuana is the Blumenhauer-Rohrbacher Amendment, which is passed on spending bills, which basically prohibits the Department of Justice from using their funds to go after medical marijuana in the states. Does not cover recreational marijuana. Um, that is still in place. That has to be renewed with every spending bill. So during the shutdown, that protection actually lapsed. Um, so that's kind of the context of what we're operating under for marijuana policy. Now, what does that mean for New York State as they implement? Well, there's some very big issues in play because of the federal state tension. Um, the first is banking. A major problem for the industry is banking prohibitions. With the rescind rescinding of the coal memo, there's been some confusion as to what is and is not allowed um, for marijuana facilities um, for banking. Because it's federally illegal, most uh, marijuana dispensaries, growers, operate as a cash-only business because they're unable to get bank accounts. Um, if they do, they're often shut down. That means they also have to keep track of all their payroll in cash, um, their taxes in cash, because they still have to pay taxes, right? Um, both at the federal and state level. It's kind of ironic that the federal government says it's illegal, but they still collect taxes. Um, because it is federally legal, that's another issue, most medical um, dispensary operations uh, tax deductions cannot be made at the federal level, which means that tends to push out smaller businesses that can't absorb the tax rate. Um, some medical facilities are being ta taxed nationally at 80 to 90 percent of their revenues. So they're being kind of, they're getting a very small profit, which is then a problem for states that think they're going to be getting a lot of money off of marijuana. Um, the other issue I'll touch, touch on real quickly, but we can discuss more in depth, I think, with the rest of the panel, is taxation on the state level. Is finding the right state uh, taxation rate to not eliminate the black market, that would be ideal, but it's unlikely, but to minimize the black market, but also to not m overtax, to make consumption be forced back into the black market. Um, because of federal restrictions, marijuana is contained within a state where it is legal. You can't trade to other states. You can't transport to other states. This is a problem for Oregon right now, who has not read the market particularly well and has a surplus of marijuana that they can't get rid of, hurting the business and hurting profits because they're, the price is plummeting because there's, they've flooded the market. So as the states consider legalization, they have to try to figure out how to implement within these market rules that they don't totally control. Thank you. Next, we're going to have Ken Pukowski from the Business Council, who's going to talk about some of the issues for employers. Um, good morning, and thanks, Bill. Um, I think EJ just stepped out of the room. Uh, we appreciate the invite to be here today, but only someone like EJ who follows tax policy uh, as closely as I do may remember about 10 years ago we had legislation introduced in New York State that would have imposed a, an excise tax on the sale of marijuana as, an, as, an, as a new enforcement mechanism. So uh, we've been talking about marijuana taxes for a while, not necessarily in this context. Um, I represent an organization, we're the statewide chamber of commerce, we have about 2,400 uh, private sector uh, members across the state 
And I think it's fair to say we, we have no position on the threshold issue of uh, legalization of recreational marijuana. I know we have members uh, who, who have strong opinions on it, but as a general issue, uh, we're not there yet. But we certainly look at, and I think some of us may consider uh, recreational marijuana an inevitability in New York State. And if that were to be the case, we certainly uh, have concerns about how this is going to be dealt with in the work in the workplace, especially dealing with the, the, the likelihood of, of workplace impairment. And to get into the weeds, as our uh, as our uh, session is entitled, we look at the legislation that was introduced as part of the governor's executive budget uh, proposal, and it creates a new and we think fairly high, no pun intended, standard for employers to respond to. Uh, marijuana-based impairment in the workplace. Right now, uh, we're at at will, uh, at will employment state. Uh, if you come to work uh, in, under the influence of alcohol, let alone uh, impaired by alcohol, your employer can take very decisive employment employment action. Employers have a vested interest in protecting the safety of individual workers, including a worker who may be impaired, other workers around them, customers, general public, you know, the reputation and performance of the business. And we see no particular reason, we see no reason at all, why workplace impairment should be different, the standard for workplace impairment uh, response should be different based on the intoxicant. Um, you know, the, one of the, the provisions of the bill says the employer has to document that some, ex, ex, some discrete job function is explicitly impaired uh, due to, to, due to uh, to cannabis in order to take legal action. Um, how about the person falls down the stairs going from one floor to the other and the employer has legal responsibility for the injuries? We, we don't see the, the, the reason for the difference. Uh, we've approached the governor's office in both houses of the legislature uh, to address that standard. A real practical issue if we move in the direction of, uh, of legalized recreational marijuana. There's a second piece in the bill we found Surprising, I think, is, is the, maybe the mildest word uh, I could uh, use for it, where in, when in envisioning this new marketplace for, the, for the, the growing and processing and selling of recreational marijuana, there's a vision that says if you get a license, if to get one of these licenses from the state, if you're an employer with more than 25 employees, you must have an organized workforce. Um, we think that's contrary to federal law. Uh, employers are, you know, prohibited from in, in involving themselves in their their workers' uh, unionization decision, but also presupposes that the workers uh, have no right to vote on whether they want to be unionized or not. Uh, I suspect that that will fall out of the bill, uh, but it, we thought it was a somewhat of a remarkable proposal uh, to be in there. Um, uh, Heather talked about some of the other practical issues. We represent a lot of members in the financial service industry and agree that there's significant uncertainty as to how, uh, with your state chartered bank, how you, uh, how you might participate uh, in this. But those are the, the major issues that we're looking at. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see how this issue develops through the uh, 20, 2019 legislative session. Thanks. Thank you, Ken. Um, our next speaker is a member of the State Assembly, uh, represents the 56th District, uh, which includes bed or Northern Crown Heights, uh, Assemblywoman Tremaine Wright. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm very happy to join you today to discuss how this opportunity that we have in New York State to dismantle what I like to refer to it as a, drug, a failed drug war policy. It's, crim, it's a criminal law based on a rationale that most people know to be false. Through personal experience or experience of our close friends or family, most people have some form of reliable proof that marijuana is not terribly harmful nor that addictive. Over 51% of American adults admit to having used marijuana. And I say admit because it's a federal drug war policy. It makes it Ill illegal to use or to possess it. Therefore, all of these people in our lives could be considered federal criminals. Of course, our sons and daughters, our husbands, wives, 
spouses, neighbors, they don't consider themselves criminals. They just believe this drug policy is illegitimate. They don't see the purpose. The marijuana pro prohibition was supposed to protect us. But protect us from what? All of these people in our lives are using it, and they have no complaints. Many of them are actually telling us the benefits of it. They still get up and go to work or go to school every day, and sometimes it even eases their pains or their jitters. And it makes it possible for them to complete what we consider regular daily tasks. The marijuana prohibition was supposed to um, reduce drug use. It hasn't. Over 50% of American adults already admit to using it. It was supposed to reduce youth access to the drug. As many of you in this room already know because of your work in the community, that hasn't happened. It was supposed to promote health. Again, it doesn't do it. What it does is deny the historical record of medicinal use, and it ignores the everyday practicalities of what people in our communities are telling us that do use it for some kind of health-related illness or challenge. It's actually denying the lived experience of many of our friends and neighbors. So I'm gonna say this prohibition is undermining our health, preventing care, and prohibiting research. It's creating a structure that actually inflates the cost of the product for those people who are using it in that manner. So this marijuana prohibition achieves none of its stated goals, but it works effectively to oppress people of color. Marijuana prohibition is harmful. It is enforced unevenly, and while we have over 50% of the adult American population admitting to use by and large, it's the only people of color that have to worry about being stopped, arrested, and charged. In every jurisdiction, the arrest of blacks and Latinx men double, if not quadruple, those of their white counterparts. These arrests have had far-reaching effects throughout communities. It creates barriers to um, education, employment, housing, Occupational licenses are lost. They cannot access public benefits, including veterans' um, benefits. It exacerbates poverty. It bars adoption. We are facing an opioid crisis. We know that there's lots of adoptions happening and kinship foster care occurring in our communities. The use and the prohibition of marijuana bars adoptions in cases where it's necessary, where we want to keep families together. And it may not be abuse or addiction, it's just possession and use that's barring these families from staying together. And lastly, in, a, in many of the immigration cases, it may lead to deportation. Arrest may not result in incarceration, but it also leads to fines, which grow to larger fines if they're left unpaid, and then it becomes warrants. So again, arrest and incarceration possibilities. It's an ever-increasing web of police, judicial, and corrections contacts. Legalization is our opportunity to acknowledge some of the shortcomings of our drug war policy. This is our chance to direct energy and resources into building an industry within New York State that generates jobs, opportunities, revenue, and reinvestment. Actually, this is not only our chance, this is our responsibility. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Finally, we're going to have Kevin Sabet, uh, president of Smart Approaches to Marijuana, a science-based policy organization. He's also director of the Drug Policy Institute at the University of Florida, assistant professor in the College of Medicine Department of Psychiatry. Good morning, everyone. You know, sometimes I feel like with this issue of marijuana and then the debate we're having that we're living in, not 2019, uh, but 1919, uh, with the debate with tobacco in 1919. You know, in 1919, we knew we were beginning to get the studies showing tobacco caused lung cancer, that it had a host of negative harms, uh, and it was a drug that and plant that had been used for thousands of years, but it had only recently become harmful because the advent of a new industry. In that case, it was an industry that invented the automatic cigarette-making machine and changed the whole infrastructure of what tobacco was because of technology. 
Uh, we ended up having zero deaths due to tobacco before 1900 to now 420,000 a year last year, more incidents of lung cancer last year than even 20 years ago because lung cancer takes a while. It's the single most preventable death we have in the world. And we have that because of this massive industry that has profited off of addiction. And we are recreating that nightmare right now with this discussion of marijuana legalization. We've set up a false dichotomy that you either have to criminalize people and throw them in prison and give them a criminal record, uh, give them fines that add up and target the most vulnerable with the criminal justice system, or you have to legalize marijuana. And I don't buy into that false dichotomy. I think that, that there are many, many smarter things we can do that do not create a 21st century big tobacco 2.0 but that also stop criminalizing people and saddling them with criminal records. I wish my friend Mitch Earlywine represented the reality of the industry in New York State. I really do. Um, because him and his friends at Normal, I think, started out on the decriminalization side, which I can agree with. But it has completely changed now, the discussion, to the commercialization of marijuana and this new industry. Uh, John Boehner and his friends just hired 20 lobbyists in Washington, D.C. The Cannabis Trade Federation has 15, and Brownstein Hyatt, the most um, illustrious K Street firm in Washington, also has a dozen or so marijuana industry lobbyists. So for them, this is about money. So it shouldn't surprise you to learn that Philip Morris has now invested over a billion dollars in the marijuana industry. It shouldn't surprise you to know that the head of former president of Purdue Pharma and, and those of us in New York saw the demonstration at the Guggenheim last weekend where the hundreds of thousands of prescriptions to protest the Sackler family, which was the family behind Purdue Pharma, that that occurred. But the former president of Purdue Pharma has less, have left Purdue Pharma and is now the president of a marijuana company and started his own. Folks, we are being bamboozled all over again by an industry that has put more pot shops in Colorado than McDonald's and Starbucks combined that is breeding THC products now that do not represent Woodstock, and it was nice to pass that sign on my way here up from the city. Uh, marijuana is not Woodstock anymore, it's Wall Street. It is not uh, Berkeley, and I can say that because I'm a graduate of the University of California, Berkeley. It is not Berkeley anymore, it's Silicon Valley. It's our friends at Stanford and in the Silicon Valley an hour south of us who are laughing all the way to the bank. We should not arrest and criminalize people we don't need to have, we can fix the decriminalization law here. We don't need to be, and we should not saddle them. We should absolutely do research. We should absolutely research the medical value, but do not conflate medical marijuana and the proper use of marijuana's components as medicine with decriminalization, which is about social justice, which as, a pres as President Obama's senior drug policy advisor for two and a half years, I can tell you I care about. Got to also say it's the ultimate irony that John Boehner is pushing for marijuana. He blocked every single criminal justice reform we tried to get through in 2009. So that's just the extra irony for me. And then conflating it again with full legalization, which is commercialization. The folks writing this bill and beyond writing this bill, I think there are a lot of well-intentioned people who support this in New York right now, but they're not going to be around in 10 years when there are the dozens of lobbyists from the marijuana industry who try and tear down every single regulation. I wish we could listen to Mitch Earlywine and cap THC content. No state's ever done it. I wish we could listen to other people and focus on only social justice. Do you really think that the inner city is going to benefit from this? They're going to be the ones opening the major marijuana farms and stores? Folks, you need $10 million to just walk into the room right now to even get it, forget about if you want to give them a license. It's not just a license. You need tens of millions to start a successful marijuana company. Do you think that the kid in uh, uh, Brooklyn and kid in Queens is going to compete with Philip Morris on that front? We're, we're kidding ourselves if we think that. But we do know that this is going to disproportionately hurt people of color. Because I'll tell you, if a cop wants to arrest you and give you a record, maybe he can't do it for marijuana if it's legal, but they'll find 23 other reasons uh, uh, to do it if you believe that's going to happen. So I, we're trying to say, and this, and I know time's up, but I want to make one final point. This was, um, you know, a pipe dream, if I can, no pun intended. A, a month ago, we were kicked out of the rooms across the street. People said it's done, it's in the budget, it's a done deal. Well, a month later, we see that it's not a done deal. We see that it is going slower. We're arguing to go slow, figure this out. No state in the country has legalized marijuana via legislature. Please remember that. 
only states with ballot initiatives financed by the pot industry have passed retail legalization. In Vermont, they did legislature, but it was possession only. They did not do retail. No state has done it. I know as New Yorkers, and, and, and I love to th think this too, now that I'm a New Yorker of the last five years, I love, I know that we like to say that we can sort of do it better than anyone else and we'll be the one state that figures it out. On this one, I have a lot of skepticism because of the interests of the industry. So let's go slow. Let's learn what has happened in the other states. Let's fix social justice on its own merits and medical marijuana on its own merits and not think that we're gonna be able to pull a fast one on the dozens of lobbyists and special interests who stand to make a ton of money with this today's very high potent THC. Thank you. So thank you to all the panels. Um, we obviously have a, a wide range of opinions up here. Um, and also some, some um, people who are very knowledgeable about particular aspects. Um, I'd like to um, start with uh, a question for Assemblywoman Wright. Um, we, we've just heard the argument that this is going to be, that, that it already is and will be dominated by large corporate owners. I know there's a lot of interest. Um, I've heard it from um, supporters of the bill. I've heard it from Mayor de Blasio. More recently, I've heard it from Governor Cuomo that they want to somehow head that off. They want to direct this industry to the communities that have been harmed by over-incarceration in the past. How would that work? I believe the best way to think about it is that we want to allow there to be access points for everyone to participate. I should say everyone, for those who are interested to participate, that we are no longer going to mandate that people manage the product from the seed to the actual retail product. So there are various points of entry we're going to create. Instead of it being a vertical process, it'll be horizontal. Um, we will allow everything from distribution, retail, transportation, security, growing, um, testing to be different licenses. And when we are um, breaking up the process in that manner, we will allow folks to enter into this um, industry. And we also have a proposal before us where monies from the initial license sales will create a fund that where people are able to access for capital startup as well as technical assistance. And we envision that there will be a reinvestment fund so that um, we are consistently making investments into communities that have been harmed. Do you, so is it fair to say you share the concern that this would be, that the that it would be another, like Philip Morris would be running the, the uh, marijuana industry? I don't think there's any way to deny that people who are already in the business are poised to take advantage first. People who have been given privilege and opportunity to work in an industry which almost mirrors whatever, mirrors what this could be, are poised to take advantage of it. We have to admit that. Um, just like all of our medical providers in this state so far, the, we sold 10 licenses, we're down to seven holders at this point. We know how business works and we understand that. We're not saying that suddenly that our medical people are gonna be barred from participation. Um, they are gonna, if they wanted to open up a new business, they already have resources available to them and know-how. So I think we have to operate in the space that we know that there's opportunity for those people, but we have to create space for others. Okay. Um, Heather. Oh yeah, go ahead. Don't mind. So in this, I think this very room about about a month ago, there was another panel, uh, sort of on the same topic. And one of the things we were asked about was to comment on the uh, economic development opportunities of, of recreational marijuana. And the one observation I had was I thought many commentators, if not advocates, were really way overestimating the, uh, you know, the, the, the economic consequences or return on this. And to the point where one of the questions was, I, I, that uh, they thought, one of the commentators said we could fund the MTA's capital plan um, through the revenues generated by marijuana sales, and I, I probably not. Um, but I do think is a, you know, just as sort of a casual 
a citizen observer of all this. I do think that uh, we're we're thinking that this this legalization process can produce, uh, I think, a lot of. Uh, economic benefits and social benefits. I do think they're disproportionate to what the uh, what the actual outcomes will be. Even uh, in the executive budget proposal, uh, fully implemented several years down the road, uh, is projecting tax revenues of up to three hundred million dollars, which is not inconsequential, but um, it doesn't really bend the you know the, the spending curve in the state. Uh, and in all that conversation, I hear, you've heard a lot about uh, this from some of the other presenters today. Uh, not a lot of discussion of what the you know what is the the budget for addressing social social factors. Um, what would be the increased uh, uh, allocations for uh, spending on on treatment and uh, and education and whatnot? So we do think that. Uh, we, we just have this sense that the the this idea of the the positive economic benefits from this are, are being a bit are being outsized. And I think if we look at that projection, which was like you said, three years down the road or so, it's less than two tenths of one percent of the entire budget. And it does not forget beyond treatment and prevention. What about the costs of greater enforcement of drugged driving laws? Because I promise the first crash that happens after legalization passes. Well, sadly, we have to often learn the hard way, like something has to happen before we are sort of shown that we need to worry about it. Um, that's gonna prompt a whole other new outcry. And in states that have legalized, AAA, and you should look at their research, not mine, the AAA Traffic Safety Foundation has found the doubling in Washington State and over 86% increase in Colorado of where they could actually look at recent use because the metabolite of THC was so high. They were able, the coroner was able to decidedly say that marijuana was a factor in, in the car crash. So when I think about what a drop in the bucket it is, we have to talk about beyond that, the potential costs. And people think you need less law enforcement if it's legalized. You actually, communities often want more law enforcement. They want more because of drug driving. They also want more because of public use and having also, you know, you know living in the city right now already where people think it's publicly legal, uh, which it's not. Uh, the, the highest proportion of 311 calls in the city, of course, as we know, is because of public, the fastest growing proportion is public marijuana use um, complaints from people, and I think the industry has oversold the popularity of this on a local level. Uh, when people are asked on a state level, they might just say, yeah, sure, let's legalize it because they don't want to put people in prison. But at the very local level, the idea of a marijuana store in your community, 70% of Colorado has banned marijuana stores in their communities. Seven out of eight cities in California has banned the sales of marijuana because on the local level, Selling edibles on the corner next to your kid's school or the library uh, is not extremely popular. I, can I jump in? Sure. So I spent about 13 years of my life on a community board. So I'm very familiar with local actions um, when we are talking about, we have SLA laws. So the determination on where consumption spaces of alcohol comes before a community board in New York City. One of the conversations as, as we talk about legalization are consumption spaces. And we do want to see consumption space because we don't want folks out on the street smoking the same way we don't have them smoking in parks. We don't have them smoking cigarettes in parks or on sidewalks. We understand that that is a concern. We also don't want them in their apartments smoking because everyone shares common walls. We understand that these things are a problem, but they're a problem today. What we're trying to do is find a solution for tomorrow that includes a consumption space. And we're not trying to act as though we're going to collect so much tax that we're going to suddenly have every child graduating and earning a full ride to the best school in, of your dreams. But we are willing to say that a percentage of dollars will go to education, as we've seen in other states. And the reinvestment monies are not to say that suddenly we are going to eradicate poverty, but we will be making a dent in giving people access to monies to set up businesses. And we're not thinking everyone is going to touch the product because it is a very real concern that they cannot take the federal um, tax deductions. And so I know in my community, we've had after one conversation on cannabis and through my office, at least four different groups have set themselves up to discuss how they participate in tertiary markets. So we're not trying to act as though we're all gonna become farmers. But we are acknowledging that 
hemp is an opportunity and that we need to be involved in what industrial hemp looks like and that there's not a hemp um, processing center downstate. We are talking about whether or not there is information online so that seniors who want to talk about using creams and rubs for their arthritis mm -hmm. can go online and access that information and get a, or, and or get a newsletter in their um, community center about it. Those are the businesses. So we don't necessarily have to be talking about $10 million. Sometimes we're talking about $10,000 or even $1,500 to get a small business off the ground. And oftentimes we're talking about the people who are on building out the business that does doggy treats. Every one of my local businesses that um, sells animal toys and treats has a CBD line. My um, alternative health care centers have CBD products already. So we're not only talking about THC, we're talking about the access to hemp, and we're talking about THC. So we're not allowing it to be this small conversation. We need to have a broad conversation, because you're absolutely right. There's way too much money on the table for us to be talking about one pot when we know that there's a whole buffet. And that's what we've got to be a part of. So I, I have a question uh, related to this for, for Heather. Okay. And, and, and I, I think by extension for Ken. Um, how possible is it for large corporations to get involved in this business, given the state of federal law? Like, it, it, you know, Philip Morris is not a cash business. They, you know, and, and some of these companies are uh, sell on the stock market. Like, is that even conceivable when it's, when it's you know, the, the, the given the state of federal policy? Um, well, they're actually probably the best positioned because they can run at a loss for these markets, um, because they can pay the high federal tax rates. The ninety percent of your revenues, a small mom and pop group can't do that. Right. Um, so it's really they are well positioned to. They're thinking ten years down the road, right? When this is going to be potentially legalized everywhere, um, and so they certainly have the infrastructure to handle this better than a smaller group. Uh, whether their shareholders care about it, that's a different issue. Um, most people are kind of enthusiastic; they see dollar signs on this. Um, so it has not been, um, you know. Kevin was right that there is a lot of, you know, Anheuser-Busch and Philip Morris and a lot of those big companies are stepping into this market because they see potential gains. But, like, are they stepping into the, in the, in the sense where they're actually um, buying and selling something that's illegal at the federal level? Because um, they can't sell across state lines. Right, they, right. They can't have a bank account. They typically... Um, there's starting to, some of them are pro proactively getting into it, like getting a bottling plant or getting ready for certain things. But others are poised to accumulate smaller organizations that are already in this market. Um, so the dispensaries that are already exist are starting to get outreach from these larger groups for when it becomes legalized in more places. Do you have any? I mean, large and small is a relative term. <clears throat> As we've seen in the, uh, the medical uh, marijuana market in, in New York, I mean, it's a, it's a complex, highly regulated, uh, business and fairly well capitalized groups have been been involved. Um, I really haven't thought about whether how this translates to a publicly traded company, but um, it's it's been an expensive business to be in so far, at least in the New York State market design. That might be the tax revenue we're looking for. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was just thinking of a legal action. Um. <laughs> so um, going back to Assembly Member Wright. Um, is this, it, when I hear the idea that you're going to um, try to direct the business into um, the communities that were impacted, and you're going to try to steer it away from the large corporations, you're talking about, I guess you're talking about awarding licenses, So and you're going, the criteria for the license are going to be that you aren't a large corporation and that you have a certain background? So there are preferential licenses proposed and it does include um, licensing for to, oper to touch the plant. I'm just gonna say to touch the plant um, because we don't wanna say that it's only retail um, for people who have been harmed. So yes, there is a um, a preference there. How, how would you and define the, the harm? Like how, how incarceration. 
so, um, so arrests. A, per, a person with uh, an arrest record would have a preference for the low. They may very well have one. Um, those, all of the terms have not been obviously agreed to, but yes, those are the considerations that we want to make. And we also want to look at people who are in communities that have carried the burden of over-policing. So communities, without fail here in New York State, we could go precinct by precinct and determine exactly where we've made the bulk of our arrests. We have, I think since 77, over 60, 650 million people have been stopped and um, charged with marijuana possession at least. So a marijuana possession or use. We know where those people, we know where they come from and it's not even across the board. So would it be neighborhood based? If you, if you grew up in a certain zip code or a certain neighborhood, you would be a preference for a license? It definitely can it be that. Or it could be by um, police precincts. We have, we have information which we can use to refer back. So it may not go by zip code since zip codes are broken up, uh, are split between pre um, precincts. It may look at um, precincts so that we have the opportunity to see where they actually are doing enforcements because precincts are usually small enough um, to capture, to get a good idea of the impact to the community, to make the relational um, look back. Hey, um, I guess I'll throw this next one at Kevin Sabat. Um, what, like, how, is, do you say, is, is there a model for that, um, is there a conceivable system you can imagine that would um, achieve those dual objectives of channeling the economic benefits to the to the harmed communities and and prevent you know the large scale corporatized commercialized or is that just impossible? Well, I think the costs are always going to outweigh the benefits. Uh, I think that again, if we have racism in our criminal justice system, the idea that we're going to make a big dent through marijuana arrests, I think, is uh, very far off. I think that the, when you are in the most vulnerable communities, you will be affected the most. Why? Because you are more likely to rely, for example, on a job that requires a drug test. And they don't care if you said it's for your whatever um, wellness or your hemp cream or your THC edible that you wanted to have last night uh, if you test positive. It's why in Colorado, they can't even hire construction that can pass a drug test. They're now hiring in Idaho, which Idaho is very happy about it, by the way. Uh, but Colorado's not because they're not able to hire. And so um, I think when you're also in a poorer community, you're less likely to have access to health care and non-federal, which by the way, totally illegal on the federal level, nothing to stop the US Marshals, in which they've done in Colorado and elsewhere to make mass arrests of people in federal public housing. Um, but beyond federal public housing, you're, you're more likely to have uh, you know, less of a chance to get um, you know, uh, education, healthcare, housing, and you are then more likely to slide into addiction. Addiction and problems with marijuana, which we know uh, about 42% of people who used marijuana last month are using it every day now. So there has been a marked increase in the volume of marijuana use, and we're seeing treatment centers and other places uh, fill up due to marijuana, not for everybody, but for a sizable portion of those folks. Um, they are, you know, you're less likely to have access to even an adequate treatment facility if you are from those communities. So just like I don't think anyone could say with a straight face that we have social justice with alcohol, or social justice with gambling, or social justice with tobacco. I don't know why we think on marijuana, like it's gonna be the one time we make an exception. It's gonna be the one thing we get right. It's gonna be the one thing we regulate okay. It's gonna be one thing there will be zero government corruption on. It's gonna be the one thing we're not gonna have, because this is, by the way, a lot of government intervention for our, you know, our libertarian friends in the audience. Um, the, the, this is, it's the one thing where we're not gonna have a thriving underground market. That There's now major, uh, black market activity in legalized states like Oregon and California. They are producing eight times more marijuana than they can legally sell to every adult who would want it. So where is that going? It's not being flushed away in the Pacific Ocean. It's transnational cartels that have, that aren't just dealing with drugs, they're dealing with all kinds of other crimes, human trafficking, et cetera, that are getting involved. So uh, the black market is thriving in these legal states. We haven't mentioned that. And I see, you know, in Detroit, there was a big pushback 
on legal marijuana. It's why the NAACP of Detroit was vehemently against the legalization of marijuana in Michigan. Um, they couldn't compete with the industry dollars and they lost that fight. But you know, their saying was hope, not dope. Their saying to us was, can you please offer something better than more drugs in our community? We'd like to aspire to something better. Maybe less than 0.5% of us will go on to be pot like entrepreneurs and can compete with the Philip Morris board members and good for them. But for the vast majority of us, they told us this was a net negative on their community. You should read the New York Times article from a few years ago, front page, about the activists in Compton. When marijuana was legal in California, the vast majority of the pot shops were opening up in poorer communities, the communities with less power. Because in Beverly Hills, they wanted to pretend that they were all cool with pot. And then when someone wanted to o open a pot shop near you know, little Johnny's like $25,000 a year preschool, no way. And so they were going to those communities. But these two activists in Compton said, you know, I, we know that we're known for chronic. We know that we're known, oh, Dr. Dre came from here, we get it. But that is not the reputation and the future we wanna offer to our young people. And they've actually completely banned marijuana establishments in Compton. They think it's gonna be a negative. So I think the people in Compton and Detroit are right. I also think it's very important for all elected officials because it's been an incredible about face from people that I respect. Again, as a former Obama appointee, this governor, the, my mayor, um, who share a lot of concerns about corporate marijuana. Mayor de Blasio is being dragged to this position, which he does clearly is uncomfortable with, but he has to embrace. I would like all politicians dealing with this and to promise not to take pot money, promise not to employ marijuana lobbyists if this passes. And I'm worried that many would even do that because when we're looking into the federal funding for legisl uh, co members of Congress who get pot money and the way they're voting and what's happening, you kind of wonder what the change of mind has been, because it's not the science, by the way. I mean, this is where my fellow, you know, I'd say to my fellow Democrats as a pro-science party, you can't be in favor of marijuana legalization where every single medical association in the country opposes it. So, where, so, so I think we have to reconcile a lot of these issues, um, and we're going way too fast right now in this capital to air those out. Tim? How much time do we have in the whole event? Oh, okay. Um, so I'd like to take some questions from the audience if people are interested. We have a microphone in the back, and, and uh, Dan, are you going to move around with a microphone? Uh, somebody? I can line up. Or hand back there. No. Hi, I have a question for Assemblywoman Wright. Yes. Right now, there isn't enough money to fund the staff for prevention and treatment programs in New York um, for both the mental health system and the substance abuse prevention and treatment system. We know that with high THC marijuana, there are going to be more people who are becoming addicted and who are going to need treatment. There isn't enough money in this year's budget even for the workforce to staff these places. How are we going to possibly deal th with this when we're overwhelmed with marijuana? So. Marijuana is less addictive than alcohol and um, tobacco. We would, I think it's on average about maybe 10% of those who try marijuana become addicted. So I don't think that we're going to see a tremendous increase in the number of addictions, that that is going to be what burdens our human services system. The problem with our human services system is that we don't properly fund it right now. It's not a function of whether or not uh, marijuana becomes legal. It's that we need to prioritize uh, mental health as well as substance abuse um, treatment. And we need to find a way today so that we can reallocate funds within our budget so that that is properly staffed and reflects our uh, increased minimum wages and also provides all the other be associated benefits of, of employment that we're supposed to be providing. The statistics that you just quoted on addiction mm -hmm. are based on marijuana that have low levels of THC. The current THC products are much, much more addictive, so that number is not true. So now that we know that high-potency marijuana is just as addictive as alcohol. Well, I'm going to say I have not seen that study, and I'm going to say that we are in a position where if we are regulating it, we do have the ability to regulate the percentage of THC in it. At this point, we are in a black market. Um, New York City, New York, New York City is the biggest black market for marijuana. 
It is by far the place where we need something to give people pre consumer protections. We know that there's no, just because we legalize it, it does not mean it's gonna disappear. We've had the lotto in this state for over 30 years. They're still illegal numbers. The reason that we had the craft beer market um, coming up is because every kid in chemistry learns how to make beer. It's not hard to do and that there's always been these other places where um, illegal markets have existed. We need to be able to give some consumer protection. It doesn't mean eradication necessarily immediately of the black market, but it means that we need to put some consumer input, uh, protections in place. So just real quick on that. that, that's an attractive argument if you believe that you can regulate the legal market. Forget about it, we can right. agree there will be an underground market. Let's simplify that to the side. In Oregon and Colorado, uh, what they're testing, the majority of what they're testing, they are finding uh, pesticides, mold, bacteria, on the legal market. And Oregon just quietly put out, I love when government agencies, we used to just put out a report on Friday at 4.30, um, which is always fun. They did, they did that and we said, well, what is it? It was Secretary of State saying that they haven't even looked at 97% of the legal market. The 3% that they looked at, the majority showed pesticides, insecticides, herbs, and mold, herbicides, mm -hmm. molds, bacteria. Marijuana is a very energy thirsty plant, needs a lot of light and a lot of water. So our environmentalists, please take note. Um, because there's very little green other than the color of marijuana. And when you look at that, you see what the incentives, especially for these bigger companies, to add agents to it. Uh, I, you know, I get the attraction to, like, for, the, for the adult, and there will be plenty of them, I totally agree. A lot of 50-year-olds can smoke marijuana and fall asleep on a Friday night, and it's no big deal for them, they do it once a week, and it's fine. Um, but the idea that they will even be protected, I think, is, um, a little bit of a stretch given, again, maybe New York is just gonna do it much better than the eight other states, Canada, and some of the, the Netherlands has done for 40 years. It's possible, but so far the evidence doesn't quite point that way. Okay. Uh, good, good morning. First, I wanna thank you all for being here. This is such an important conversation because it affects everyone in our communities. Um, my name's Judith Margulies. I'm a pharmacist. Um, I uh, do many things now, include participate in my local coalition for prevention. But I have one specific question that I wanted to ask, and I really apologize. I, for, I can't see your name, but the gentleman in the center concerning the economic development pieces of this. Um, I recently, I read most, not most, much of the of the, the research on this from you know medical journals, the, 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 in, the primary sources. Um, and recently um, I put together some information concerning the, um, the effects that, the impairment that is uh, results from cannabis smoking. And Dr. DuPont actually had a slide recently in his presentation, Dr. Robert DuPont, you can look up his name, um, concerning that, as we all know with alcohol, when um, the amount of alcohol drops in your body, your impairment actually drops. So that's why we actually have a level. We don't have that with marijuana because as the level of THC drops, the, the curve is not related. So according to the data, there is some still impairment with driving up to three weeks after. Not in is there, everyone. Is there a question? So my question is, my question about the impairment piece is if the data is showing that, I don't know if it's one out of 100 or one out of 100,000 who gets in a vehicle or goes into an employment situation. Is there a part of this, if there's a law on the books, is there a proposal there to make a statement such in the law so that anyone who consumes or ingests marijuana in any form, that up to three weeks after they cannot drive a vehicle or in your employment you know, situations, run a, a piece of equipment? Um, I mean, the legislation introduced in New York State, none of those are specifically addressed. Um, the concern, you know, that I talked about earlier is, you know, real concern of employers where, again, not knowing, n not having a you know, bright line way as you would for, uh, for alcohol, at least in, in, for DMV purposes, for motor vehicle purposes, that uh, an employer who, uh, who uh, discerns uh, what they consider to be evidence of, of impairment in the workplace 
ought to be able to take action because of just what you mentioned that you were I mean in some federal mm -hmm. if we're some federal licensed occupations uh, it's a, it is a it is a bright line uh, any any level uh, is is grounds for for action um, we there's no uh, proposal today to, you know to create a impairment percentage uh, but we do think employers have to have the protection to be able to respond to examples where they see somebody uh, who appears to be under the influence. What criteria would that be? Would that be observation? Because according to Dr. DuPont's presentation, um, the, uh, the impression of impairment does not go down as the, as the actual impairment through testing actually does. So, and I don't mean I don't mean drug testing, but actually, you know, reaction types of testing. You know, the components that one needs for driving. So, if I've heard the industry state that, um, or people proponents, I want to say state that until there is scientific evidence, you cannot have any of those laws on the books. But how does that protect the public who's going to be driving on the road with those individuals, or? being experiencing it in a job situation if there is no um, ability to determine when that person is actually impaired because it's not correlated with with levels so is three weeks reasonable so that if anyone is experiencing marijuana that they should not be in a da running a dangerous piece of equipment or driving a vehicle for three weeks is that where the reasonable cutoff would be but I, I think I already asked that question, so I'll sit down and I'll let somebody go. Thank you. Next question. Thank you for, uh, to the panel for sharing on this issue. Um, I'm a firefighter, actually, at the second busiest firehouse in the country, and, um, you know, I have share a lot of concerns about, you know, impairment as well. Um, but I also have another question. Um, you know, I totally agree, and this question is for Assemblywoman Wright. Mm -hmm. I'm 100% with you on the social justice aspect and removing criminal penalties for marijuana use. But when I walk out the front door of my house, the closest store to my house in any direction is a liquor store. If I go a little bit farther, there's a convenience store, but it's so plastered with advertisements for tobacco, for alcohol, for the lottery that I can't even see inside. And so my question is, what? Why would we kind of, re why do we have to repeat what, what we've done with alcohol and tobacco? Why do we have to do that again with, with marijuana? Isn't, isn't two of these recreational addictive industries enough? Can't we accomplish you know, the social justice goals without that? So you don't have to, you don't have to replicate it. I honestly don't think, I think that it is a problem with our SLA laws that liquor stores don't go before their local communities before they're opened only consumption spaces go before our local communities. So if any of you are familiar, one of the poorest communities in New York, in New York State is Brownsville, Brooklyn. That community has absolutely no bars. They have liquor stores, but they have no bars. Why? Because bars goes, that's something that has to go before the community, while liquor stores are automatically given a license from the state. So we're not saying just free reign for everyone. We're actually very much in favor of community control and having a community voice in the process so that you can determine, so that if you do have a community like a Compton that's saying, you know what, we don't want sales nor consumption spaces, we're honoring those things. We don't have to repeat it. We should be learning from it and doing better in this time around. So I think one thing in the executive budget, which was concerning, and this may not, of course, be the final uh, proposal, I hope it's not, is that any more towns under 100,000 would not be able, would not be allowed to opt out. Uh, we've never seen that in any proposal in the country, in any state, or local, in the world, even in, in Canada, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So I do worry about that because it's also forcing then towns have a very difficult job. They have to bind together and on the county level, maybe they can do it. Um, but it's difficult, I think, on the local control. But I think the advertising is still going to be an issue unless we can convince this Supreme Court, and maybe Assemblywoman, you can do that. I'm not very uh, uh, <laughs> optimistic to convince this Supreme Court that commercial and corporate speech isn't free speech. I think yeah, it's going to be very I don't difficult. Think, I think that we're going to have a hard right. time with that. But we also have to, I think we also have to honor the fact that we are getting a more educated populace, and they're going to demand certain things in, they're going to demand certain information in labeling. So I was just sharing with someone that a couple of products that someone had bought back from 
Okay, I did see it. They brought that from California. Um, <laughs> but the labeling is what I wanted to um, tell you. It identified where it was grown, when it was picked, where it was processed, as well as the um, THC levels. So that's the demand that we're starting to see in one of the legal markets. And I think that we're gonna see something similar. 10 years ago, no, very few products in our grocery stores listed um, GM, whether or not it was GMO. Now almost everything from crackers to cheese to sa sausage, everything lists that information, if it's organic or not. So we're gonna see some, some demands from community that's going to refl be reflected in what we get from our producers. But I do think that one of the major things we have to support is local control in the process. Just a quick follow up on the liquor store question, I guess kind of as a, you know, it's there. You know, I know a lot of people maybe on the other side of the aisle, the Republican side might, you know, believe in trickle down economics, but like I haven't seen my community help from like taxes on alcohol or the lottery or tobacco. So why would we believe that, you know, trickle down economics essentially is gonna work with marijuana when it, you know, like why is this all of a sudden going to be uh, different in, in this instance in when it hasn't like happened yet? Thank you. We don't wanna put it into the general fund. There are some spaces, we've seen it in other states too, and some of those dollars that you identified get to be rolled into general fund. We do not wanna see this being able to be rolled into the general fund. The home grow question, it's really looming. If we can't have it, why not? And how would we enforce it if we can? Same deal, I'd love to hear anyone's opinion. So I'm gonna go out and say I support home grow. I think that it also um, helps to improve the lives of those who are using it for medicinal purposes. Um, I think that, I think home grow is going to look similar to alcohol. The same, like I grew up with a grapevine in my backyard. I know how to make wine. Um, there, but the average New York City, gr Brooklyn girl doesn't know how to make wine. Or has a garden. Well, no, <laughs> I live in Brownstone, Brooklyn. We have <laughs> backyards, but I it's, um, <laughs> those are, so there's some things I think most people, if you look back one generation, they come from somebody's farm. There's some things you know because of where you come from. And there's some things that I know because that's where I came from and I know it. I'm not gonna suddenly become a wine producer. But I do think that it's possible to put regulation in space. We have a thriving, wonderful market in California for grapes and wine and tourism. And we don't see people growing in the park. They're not taking over space there. So I think that it's, some of it is going to become just practice because people don't know how to do it. They will fall out of practice. They won't be able to grow. It's more work that most people are lazy. We don't, I mean, we don't like to admit it, but most people are lazy. They want the least common denominator and that's going to be going to buy the product instead of growing it themselves. Are there people that we will have to monitor and police because they will try to abuse the system? Yes, there's no fail proof system for anything. But I do think that growing a plant in your house and up to, some people say six, some people say 12 plants. Whatever the number, the right number ends up being, I think it's gonna be about canopy and production versus just the number of plants, those that flower, those that don't, so that we can have a real conversation about use. And unfortunately, I'm still learning a lot about the plants. Um, so I don't know exactly what that number is, but I do think that we should have access to home grow. So I think, again, we're conflating a lot of different issues. We've, I've heard hemp, CBD, cream, THC, waxes, edibles, flour, um, you know, and, and I think, you know, medical, non-medical decriminalization, it, it goes back to, I think we need to separate these issues. And, um, you know, the hemp thing just, I mean, sure, if people want to do that, it hasn't helped. Canada and China have done it uh, for a couple hundred years, and it's not even a blip on their GDP radar. It's such a minor market. It, it is not an economic boon. I think a lot of farmers in Kentucky are going to be very disappointed in that because they're betting on hemp, um, and that's a bad bet. But that being said, uh, that's not really, I think, what a lot of folks and a lot of people are concerned about. It's the high THC stuff. It's the fact that we have 99% concentrates that are being used like a jewel, uh, which compares to 3 to 4% THC um, that, that 
was smoked you know, 30 years ago. And I think that this is the home grow issue is a vexing complication for legalization advocates because on the one hand, a lot of the movement and the um, sort of, again, hate to use these puns, but they're everywhere, grassroots movement, um, start, was about growing your own and kind of, you know, peace and equality. Again, the guys I went, you know, saw at Berkeley every day, I mean, the residents of, of Berkeley. Um, they wanted to grow their own and they did grow their own and that was fine, but the one issue Colorado has admitted uh, that was an utter failure with legalization, other than they said, boy, this did nothing for our budget. So that was the one. But the other big one was, boy, the worst part of our law was homegrown. And they went back and with the lobbyists in Denver, um, because homegrown does not help the industry, obviously, and it's much easier to grow marijuana than it is to make uh, for profit than it is to make alcohol, let alone tobacco or opium or other plants. Uh, and so the industry closed that loophole. That was the one thing Governor Hickenlooper sort of like admitted, okay, we did this wrong. And they closed it after a couple of years of lobbying by the industry, which got more and more and more and more powerful as the years went on. So, uh, you know, I think there will be some people that can grow their own and be able to do it. I don't think that's really gonna compete because uh, with the legal market, once it's fully mature and established, because <clears throat> um, even though it's a lot easier to do than tobacco or alcohol, the, the prices plummet on the legal market, which I actually find is a problem for public health because the cheaper something is, the more likely people are to abuse it. And we have to remember the one goal of the industry is to encourage heavy use. That's how they make money. 15% of all alcohol, 15% uh, of drinkers consume 75% of the volume of alcohol in this country. They're alcoholics, they drink 10 drinks a day, they have a big problem with alcohol. It's not a majority, it's only 15%, but that's the, that's the level that's important for the alcohol industry, are the people that drink heavily. And I worry about an industry that's corporatized that basically encourages very, very heavy use because that's their bottom line. Uh, next question. Hi, my name is Kimberly Krepp. I'm the director of the Capital District Cannabis Consortium and a writer for The Shadow. And we at the Shadow and the Capital District Cannabis Consortium think it's great that cannabis laws are finally beginning to evaporate after 80 years of senseless prohibition and criminalization that has ruined the lives of countless people, justifying a war on drugs that has never I been. I have to ask, is... Uh, I'm getting to my question. <laughs> and can never be won. However, we have a major problem when the state wants to usurp our constitutional rights for classes, corporate serving regulations and ridiculously inflate, inflated prices and taxes which will be passed directly to the consumer. It was mentioned earlier that the, the, this, uh, the DEA's Controlled Substances Act criminalized cannabis in 1970. However, they hired a commission called the Schaefer Commission, the Schaefer Report, Marijuana is Signal of Misunderstanding, that turned back a report that said cannabis was not addictive and that prohibition should be repealed and nullified on a federal level. I'd like to know why that isn't being taken accounted, especially so when is that your question? Historically, I'm not finished. <laughs> Historically <laughs> and currently, 96% of the arrests, and it's not funny when we're talking about minority arrests. Ha, 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 can we pay attention? Yeah. Talking about minority arrests. It's, so your yes, question is why isn't it being so taken how, care of at How the is this level? effective when 96% of the people arrested for low for low level marijuana arrests are black and Latino youth who will not be able to afford these exorbitant prices or be able to buy weed in their own neighborhood? So a couple of things, I love talking about drug policy history. I'm so glad you brought up the Schaefer Commission. I'll probably be kicked out of the stage for if I go on and on about history, but the Schaefer Commission of 1972 actually, as you know, I'm sure you've read it, recommended the decriminalization of marijuana, not the legalization. They actually stopped short of recommending legalization. It was also looking at research from the 1940s and 50s because in the 1970s, 1968, 1969, when they actually wrote the report before it went through review and was released three years later, they're not looking at, they, they don't have the advantage of looking at the data that Alex and others have looked at in, you know, that's come out in the last couple of years. So on the one hand, Schaefer report said no legalization, yes, decriminalization. On the other hand, about the, um, you know, the science, it was looking at science that thankfully we have more updated science now that shows very different things about the addictive nature of marijuana. But your point on arrest is a very good one because if we regulate marijuana because we're saying we want to control it and tax it, there will inevitably be people going to the black market and therefore arrest. There have been a doubling in minority arrests for public marijuana use in Denver, 
Colorado since legalization. There are now four times as many African American and Latinos arrested in Denver for marijuana than white population. This has not reduced the discriminatory laws that were there. And by the way, those discriminatory laws, which I agree are here in New York, are the case for every other, almost every other class of crime. It's not only marijuana. So, but in Colorado, they were sold, well, at least we can work on marijuana. There were 55 African-American men arrested in Denver in 2012. That's when they legalized marijuana. How many were arrested last year? Interestingly, funny coincidence, exactly 55, according to the state of Colorado. So I agree with you. It actually has the potential of increasing because of public use and because of driving arrests um, rather than decreasing. And it has shown zero impact on the disproportionate nature of arresting crime. But I have to say, I just want to add, sure. Colorado has no safe consumption space provisions. And that is one of the largest problems. And further, it's not that the law is discriminatory, it's that we are giving them something to put in their toolbox for discrimination. So we know that this is discriminatory enforcement and that this is just another tool that they use to do stop, frisk, um, arrest, char for charge and arrest. That's what this can is. I, can I ask you, Assembly Member, uh, what, what you frisk. However, the Supreme Court has abolished the stop and frisk and they're still doing it. Mm -hmm. So, so, this so is and we're still lives. doing it here in New York. It, this isn't this isn't about legalizing marijuana. It's mm -hmm. about protecting the, protecting the people in the communities. All right, I can go to the I can go buy a liquor kit and brew as much beer as I want to in my own home and do whatever I want to do with it as long as I don't sell it to anyone. But God forbid I grow 16 plants in my basement to make an a, a ounce of oil oh, for yeah. somebody that's sick. I'm going to the feds. We're still getting arrested here in Albany. We're getting arrested all the time, and it's not fair. There, there are. You guys, a lot of people say, well, you know, we can't do studies. The potheads, we have a pot parade the first weekend in May in New York City. You know me from the pot parade. I'm a speaker there, okay? You have all the evidence that you need that open air marijuana use is not adversely affecting the community. Because every year since 1970, we have not had one arrest. And we have thousands of people at that parade smoking weed. So I, I have a, a question for the assembly member. Um, you've, you've mentioned safe consumption spaces a couple times, and I'm wondering, uh, what, what do you have in mind when you talk about that? Are you talking about commercial spaces? Would they be, uh, co like, w would you pay a fee to enter them? How, how, so I'm going to throw it back to be? you. It can, look very, it can look like, what's a safe consumption space for somebody that smokes a cigar? What's a safe consumption space for people that drink wine? What's the safe consumption space for people that want to go out and have a margarita? We have various, you all have three, four, five different images pop up in your head with each of those questions. The same thing can exist for marijuana. I don't need to tell you exactly what your space needs to look like, oh, I, but I do know that we need to have some space that is legal for you to go in and consume the product which we've already determined is to be a legal product. Is addressed in the bill, I guess? No, not in the governor's. Okay. I would um, say that the THC, but it is. sorry, the THC and the waxes, especially in the high potent products, I don't know what kind of potency you'd have at these spaces, uh, in terms of the onset of problems are in another class of itself compared to cigars, which don't affect uh, the behavior at all. You can smoke a hundred cigars and drive a car um, or, you know, build a bridge or something and with a cigarette dangling from your mouth, it doesn't affect, it doesn't intoxicate you. Um, and wine is especially also very different onset alcohol than, than THC is. So they are different. I mean, it doesn't mean it's not impossible to do it, but they are different than these substances. And I worry that we conflate, but I want to, I know we have another question, so we should. Actually, oh, go oh, ahead. Sorry. This will be the last question where we've come to the end of our time. Um, thank you all so much. I've been learning so much in these couple hours that I've been here. Um, so thank each of you for that. Um, my question is specifically for uh, Assemblywoman Wright. Um, you yourself mentioned that you're still learning a lot and that yes. you still have a lot to learn. So I just want to know, um, with so much to learn, with so many different things being um, conflated, um, why does this need to happen right now? Um, I believe legalization has to happen because decriminalization has not stopped the abuses in my community. That's the bottom line. 
Um, now, how we get to the place where I'm stop, where I no longer empower people to utilize this tool to oppress people of color, that I'm open to a conversation on. But the fact that we need to get, we need to stop it immediately is what I have a hard. That's my hard stop. We must stop it. And legalization gets us much further than decriminalization because with decriminalization, we constantly see people being arrested and charged and communities impacted in ways that, with untold um, impacts, I should say that, because we count poverty or we count um, homelessness and we've decided that we're going to pay attention to um, access to student loans, but the harms go much further and I think that we've got to, we've got to find a way to stop those things. And this is it. So uh, we've come to the end of our time. Thank you all very much. This is, I imagine we could go on for hours with this. Um, it's, uh, I know I've learned a lot, and I want to thank all of the panelists. I'd like to give them a round of applause. Thank you.